Hi, my name is David Sandalo, and I am at Columbia University at the Center on Global Energy Policy and a member of the Board of Directors here at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. And I am so thrilled to be here with Majun, who is the founder and president of the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs in Beijing and a global leader on clean energy. Uh, Majun's work has been visionary and remarkable in helping improve air quality in China, water quality in China, soil quality in China. And he's used transparency, transparency uh, as a key tool for improving environmental quality. Majun is here in New York with us. Majun, welcome. Thank you, David. Uh, let me just start to ask um, uh, about the latest developments in your work. Um, it's so great to see you after, after three years, more years of um, not being together. What, what's happening in Beijing? What's happening in China with your work? Yeah, now, uh, finally, I think uh, the, uh, uh, we're, we're in the post-COVID era and uh, everything's trying to be back to normal. And uh, we again have, uh, have the, uh, all this uh, from government agencies to business to the, to the citizens try to focus more on the recovery side. And uh, of course, to us, you know, we, uh, that uh, uh, kept us pretty busy because we need to make sure that uh, through this uh, massive economic recovery program, uh, we can still manage to keep uh, the momentum to improve our air and water quality. And in the meantime, uh, try, to, uh, try, to, try to speed up the uh, climate mitigation program. Uh, it, was not, it, it was not easy, uh, but, uh, 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 but the new, uh, new challenge, you know, um, facing the new challenge, we have uh, launched a, uh, you know, we, we over the past uh, 17 years, uh, try to use our uh, Blue Map database uh, as a tool, you know, Blue Map app as a tool to engage with stakeholders and to mobilize uh, more uh, extensive participation and tap into the power of the market. And uh, we're well, very happy. So sorry to break yeah. in, but just tell us what what, uh, what is the Blue Map app for those who aren't familiar with it. It's it's such a powerful tool. Sure. Uh, when we got started uh, more than seventeen years ago, uh, we're facing a uh, massive pollution uh, challenge. Uh, you know, from the air to the water to the coastal sea soil, and uh, I trust that we need extensive participation and. Uh, and, and the precondition for that is access to information. So with that in mind, we started to build the prototype of the so-called Blue Map database to compile the environmental quality data, the discharge data, and also the, uh, the, the performance uh, records of all these uh, uh, corporations. And, uh, uh, and, and, and over the past more than 10 years of time, we managed to work together with our partners uh, to motivate uh, more transparency and uh, we're happy to see some uh, uh, expansion of, uh, of transparency. And uh, today we're, uh, we're able to track the, uh, the performance of, uh, of some millions of corporations and color code them based mm -hmm. on their performance and dot them on the digital map and um, uh, tapping into the uh, the development of mobile internet. We launched the Blue Map uh, app, and uh, so uh, bring that on, brought that on the cell phone, so people can uh, easily not just access the information, but visualize and better understand this information, and use that as a as a, as, a, as a platform to report the polluted uh, uh, rivers and to report those who, uh, corporations who violate the standards and uh, that is the blue map. Um, and uh, what have you found from this? Have you, are you seeing environmental quality improving, um, going backwards? What are the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the trends is, uh, is, uh, is moving toward a kind of a more improvement. Uh, you know, when we got started 2006, that was, uh, you know, hindsight, almost like a, a, a kind of a real uh, low point of our water quality. You know, 28% of the monitored sections of our rivers and lakes reported uh, worse than category five 
what a quality basically it's good for no use the worst mm. is category five it is worse than that mm. so um hundreds of millions 300 million people were exposed to this uh, pollution hazards uh, you know the water pollution hazards and then hundreds of millions exposed to air pollution uh, problem uh, as well um, but now through all this years uh, uh, we have managed to see an improvement uh, uh, you know Beijing uh, and the surrounding regions started uh, uh, monitoring and reporting uh, air quality from 2013 uh, that was uh, you know on the PM 2.5 level that year the annual average was 89.5 uh, micrograms um, and last year it dropped to 30 oh. so cut by nearly two-thirds uh -huh. and uh, and on the water side uh, the worst in category y five um, proportion on the national uh, national level monitoring have dropped to about one percent on 28. So that was that's uh, striking progress. Yeah, yeah, some striking programs. Thousands of rivers running black. Thousands of those uh, canals and streams running black have been uh, more or less cleaned up. You know, with massive, uh, of course, investment on infrastructure like sewage plant, but also the uh, you know the uh, corporations uh, eventually you know. Uh, in better compliance of the emission standards mm -hmm. uh, due to the, of course, uh, the, uh, the the enforcement uh, and public uh, uh, and public reporting supervision. In, in many places, the air pollution problems and water pollution problems are, are hard, but but because you can smell the air when it's dirty, because you can see dirty air, in some ways it's easier than the invisible greenhouse gases. Um, that, that are heating up the planet. Um, what, what are the latest trends in China in terms of the global warming problem and climate change? Yeah, obviously, um, you know, global warming is, uh, uh, is looming larger, you know, globally and also in China. You know, last year, I, uh, I still remember uh, it was uh, summertime when I, uh, you know, uh, Took a trip uh, to the uh, to the Jiangxi province, uh, and uh, uh, I got the chance to, to have this bird's eye view of uh, of our largest freshwater lake, uh, the Poyang Lake. During the monsoon season, it was uh, diminished to a meandering stream. Mm. Very, very the the lowest uh, point uh, since we ever have. Uh, uh, more accurate uh, uh, meteorological records. Uh, so during the summertime, you know, the, we we suffered from the uh, extreme heat wave uh, last year, and then uh, for for about two months of uh, of, of, of time, not much drops of uh, precipitation of rainfall at all during the monsoon season. So. Um, so we suffered from that and uh, from climate change as well. Um, and um, of course, China started. Uh, China took this uh, as a uh, uh, something uh, a strategic issue. And um, uh, with uh, uh, President Xi, you know, made this on um, in some way unexpected commitment to carbon peak and neutrality. You know, by 2060, China going to neutralize uh, the, its carbon emission, and uh, uh, in the year 2020, and um, uh, and, and that caught many by surprise, um, uh, and, uh, and and it was it won't be easy because at this moment uh, our emission is, uh, uh, as you know, you you're the authority on that. You know, our emission is. Uh, uh, it's more than 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide. It's over 10 billion tons. And, uh, um, and uh, roughly a third of the global total. And uh, by far the largest uh, when it comes to the current level of uh, greenhouse gas emission. And, um, uh, and we try to, we're going to artificially, you know, try to pick that. Because unlike the Western countries, uh, which, um, uh, more or less naturally picked uh, their carbon emission. Uh, we need to 
uh, create policy mechanism to try to uh, pick our emission uh, early, you know, uh, then the projection projected uh, model and uh, and try to pick that by twenty thirty by twenty thirty before twenty thirty actually, and then try to use another less than thirty years to completely neutralize this uh, more yeah. than ten billion tons of carbon dioxide. Well, the country is still growing and uh, you know uh, still going through this industrialization and massive urbanization. So it it was uh, it was not easy and um, um, it was not easy. Yeah. And and by the way, the trends you're talking about in terms of disappearing lakes and extreme heat waves are ones that are being experienced all over the world. We have. Uh, in the United States, the Great Salt Lake out in the western United States, and, and it's shrinking and disappearing, and there are similar concerns to what you're reporting. I know London had the first ever measurement of 40 degrees centigrade last summer during the same time as the heat wave in China. So these are global phenomena that are appearing um, in, in China and elsewhere. Um, uh, we don't have much time, um, so I think this is our, our last question. Um, we, um, you've, I wonder if you have advice for for young people around the world, in China or around the world. Um, you've you've charted a career that's just made such a big difference in environmental issues, um, and I know that there's people watching who are wondering. Uh, they're wondering first, how can I help you, uh, but also how can I have an impact too, and and how can I make a difference? And I just wonder if you have any thoughts for for particularly in a, any of uh, younger people who may be watching on that score. I appreciate this question and I uh, uh, really um, believe that the future belongs to the to the young people and uh, uh, and 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 the whole climate uh, impact you know matters more to them and uh, um, and all these years uh, we have been very much uh, lucky you know to have uh, uh, young talents uh, to pay attention and uh, some of them uh, join us. Some of them help us, and uh, uh, we have many interns who helped us, uh, you know, uh, all these years, and, uh, um, and and I appreciate that, um, and, uh, and and I I do believe that uh, um, the you know if we want to overcome this issue, we need uh, we need participation from uh, from as much people, as many people as possible. And uh, uh, if we can, I trust that the, the power of information, uh, if people got informed, just like in China, you know, when they understand the impact, the health impact of, uh, of the air pollution, you know, people make their voice heard millions upon millions, uh, you know, on social media and eventually uh, the government responded that with our uh, clean air action plan and clean water action plan, and on the on the climate side, I hope the uh, people, particularly the young people, also can make their voice heard, make uh, and uh, and also trying to, you know, make sure that uh, uh, that they can uh, help uh, to create uh, more knowledge uh, and uh, more information on this. I. I believe that we need, uh, you know, just like uh, when we t try to tackle the air pollution and water pollution, we need data infrastructure on the climate side. So recent years, we got more, we got, it, what, what got us busy is the creation, uh, development of the blue map for zero carbon. You know, we're trying to uh, copy the, the success, follow the success, uh, success on the on the local uh, environmental uh, uh, environment quality improvement side and uh, develop that uh, not just uh, you know global country by country map but also drill it down to the provinces because in China you know the first the three provinces that uh, put together the emission is larger than that of the EU and then the first six oh. is over the the total volume of the U.S. So we mm. need to drill it down to the province and then city by city and then sector by sector, eventually facility by facility. In China, you know, 
probably in this part of the world, uh, you don't see many smokestacks and factories, but uh, but it doesn't mean that all this mess of manufacturing was has disappeared. Mm. It's just been migrated to our parts and now being relocated, the supply chain being relocated in the surrounding regions uh, in the global south. So we need to keep that in mind. And uh, in China, 68% of our um, carbon emission is related to, to industrial production, manufacturing. So with that, um, we need to understand eventually, you know, all these products we consume, uh, you know, they all got embedded carbon in that. And uh, yeah. if we pay attention, if we can, you know, ask this question, have all these brands, you know, who can make their commitment from Paris to Glasgow to Shanghai on on net zero carbon emission, have they really translated their words into actions, particularly in the global south, particularly through their massive supply chain? Scope three, the supply chain part, have quite often been the largest uh, uh, chunk of their carbon footprint. But our experience, still many of them have not done that. So we've just launched a a uh, zero carbon supply chain initiative. Mm. I hope not just the brands and financial institutions and agencies in charge pay attention. I also hope the citizens can pay attention. You know, we're trying to develop our expand our roadmap function by allowing develop uh, you know emission factors database and based on that, allowing people to take a picture of all these uh, different consumer products and uh, and then figure out the embedded carbon, you know, through the AI technology, figure out the embedded carbon based on uh, about that, on that. I hope that uh, the young people can raise, you know, not just have gained their own awareness, but raise questions to those who have the power and resources and made open commitment to, to really hold them accountable, create a global accountability mechanism together. And I do think that uh, through this process, we can hasten, we can hasten the process of decarbonization and uh, we can uh, eventually better safeguard our planet. Those are great words to close on, Majun. Thank you so much for your tremendous contributions and work. Great to see you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.